Hello, internet people. I'm Dave Rubin, and it's time for another Friday roundtable extravaganza. Today, I'm joined by former ESPN reporter, now lady doing some stuff over at The Daily Wire, Allison Williams, the host of Stu Does America on Blaze TV, Stu Bergier, and politics and culture commentator, Lauren Chen. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Allison, I want to start with you first because I think it'll set up uh, a bunch of the stuff we're going to do related to COVID. And I said on the show, I believe on Wednesday, that I don't want to just do COVID stories anymore. Like another crazy thing happened, another expert got something wrong, another mandate happened. I want to do stories of people that are fighting back, which is why I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Can you tell people a little bit about why you are formerly an ESPN employee and now doing some stuff? with The Daily Wire. <laughs> yeah, in a nutshell, I uh, spent 10 years with ESPN and their parent company, Disney, came out with a vaccine mandate this summer and I did not comply. So I refused to get the injection. I don't feel I need it. I've had COVID, I have natural immunity. There's a plethora of reasons why I don't want to receive this injection. So I did not. And my request for an accommodation was denied. So I was uh, forced to separate, as they call it, from the company. I was fortunate enough uh, to be contacted shortly thereafter by Ben Shapiro and The Daily Wire, and they brought me on to do some special sports projects with them, which I'm super excited about. Uh, so it's been a whirlwind of a few months, but I've definitely seen the direct impact of these mandates and how they can completely uproot your life and really force people into some difficult decisions, essentially between uh, their livelihood and their freedoms. That's no place any American should be. Yeah, and I just love that you're standing up and fighting for what you believe in. It's just, that's what it's all about. Stu, you work over at The Blaze. That's kind of like the scary Daily Wire. Is Glenn not it injecting is. you people with things every morning? He does inject us every day when we walk in uh, with various substances he's found around his uh, garage, which is a little disturbing. Um, yeah, no, it's. It, I, I'm so glad people are up there are out there actually stepping up and, and taking much more risk than 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 many people in the media are taking. Uh, you know, when you have when you believe something, it's your choice. It's it, you know, it is we're talking about a situation that is serious and it's been a really crappy last couple of years. But that does not mean that the government gets to take over your life and make all of your decisions for you. And we've forgotten that. And if anyone in the world is going to defend a principle like that, it needs to be the United States. Everybody else seems to fall down for anything their their government says. If it's not for people here stepping up, no one's going to. Oh, you gave me a great segue there because Lauren is in crazy Canada. And I say that with all due <laughs> irony because I'm in crazy California. But Lauren, you're, you're basically independent. You have people that work for you, I'm sure. Do you not believe that you have the right to just force them to inject whatever you want in their bodies? You know, what's funny is that I it would never even cross my mind for me to assume that I have any type of authority, not just to mandate that they they take a vaccine, but even to ask. And that's something that, you know, I, I do, I guess, contribute to different networks here and there. I have had people ask me, oh, by the way, are you vaccinated? Because, you know, such and such studio needs to know. And it will never stop feeling like such an intrusive personal question. Uh, you know, I have had to turn down opportunities because as an unclean second class citizen, I am simply not allowed, you know, into some of these venues. And I cannot imagine being on, you know, on the end that's actually doing that to another person. And I think conservatives, uh, right wingers, we tend to be kind of like keep our head down, go with the flow. We don't want to be rule breakers by nature, I think. But things are coming to a point where it's like if we don't, I guess, resist now, then we've pretty much just lost all of our freedoms. Yeah, well said. So everybody knows, and, and the main story of the week is that Biden is basically trying to force companies with over 100 people, over 100 employees, uh, to make sure that everyone is vaccinated. Uh, the Daily Wire, Allison's new home, is one of the first companies suing against it. The Biden administration says they're going to ignore the courts. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. I'm pretty sure if the orange man said that, uh, we'd be in impeachment number seven right now. But we got some more info from the Hill here. Under an order by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, private businesses and nonprofits with more than 100 or more employees must coerce their unvaccinated employees to get vaccinated, undergo weekly testing, or lose their jobs. Penalties can be $14,000 per violation, and they go up from there. We've got a little more from The Daily Wire. A U.S. federal appears, appeals court issued a stay on Saturday 
temporarily halting Democrat President Joe Biden's vaccine mandate that would have required companies with at least 100 employees to get vaccinated for the coronavirus or be tested weekly. Lauren, as somebody that you care about sports, like that's obviously your first love. Now you're in a political fight that's become a very personal fight. Does this all just feel completely insane? And, and what are some of your uh, colleagues or ex-colleagues saying? Because I'm guessing that there's a lot of others. Like this isn't just you. I'm guessing you mean me, right? You said Lauren, but- Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I, I, sorry. Well, he said he loved sports. I knew he wasn't talking yeah. to me. <laughs> like, that sorry, is me. <laughs> um, no, this is just complete insanity. And the fact that we're even having this conversation in the United States of America like, blows my mind. Imagine if I would have said two years ago, there's gonna come a point where the federal government is going to require you to receive an injection that you don't want and probably don't need in order to maintain your employment. You would have said, no way, we have a constitution, we are a free people, that would never happen in this country, and yet here we are. I mean, it's, it's really mind blowing when you stop and step back and think about it. Now, I am optimistic right now. I think it was huge that the court issued that stay so quickly. Um, I think it says a lot that Daily Wire is one of several countries across the, across the country that are fighting this mandate. Uh, states have joined in as well, uh, but it's just ludicrous. I mean, and for OSHA to say that they have to do this to prevent, quote, grave danger. Can, can we define grave danger? I mean, you have a 1.6 chance 1.6% chance of dying from this virus. And I'm not trying to downplay like the lives that have been lost by it, but that those are very, very slim numbers. And I would imagine even lower, right, for people who are of working age. So this is just completely unjustified. It's a constitutional violation in every way, shape and form. It's such a blatant overreach of the government. I mean, I think even this administration knows that they, they don't have the legal authority to do what they're doing. And I just I just caution the American people who, who think the vaccination is the way out of this and the mandates are the way to get there. Like, what are you willing to risk to achieve this? Because as I said before, power given is seldom return. And you go down this road, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? When the government can have uh, the authority to tell you that you don't have bodily autonomy and what you have to do with your body, that that's freaking scary to me. I don't know about you guys. And I, I honestly think when I talk to people as individuals, when I connect with them on an individual level, they understand this is wrong, yep. but it's when they get in this like group think or this corporate culture, they say, no, 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 we have to do it. But individually, they see that this is such a violation. All right, now to the other Lauren, I thought it was my body, my choice. Wasn't that the feminist thing? Yeah, well, it's funny. It's my body, my choice, except except when it comes to this vaccine, apparently. And the reasoning I've heard for the difference is that, well, you know, your vaccination status actually affects someone else. So it's like, I don't think you want to start bringing who else abortion affects into the argument. You may not like where that <laughs> is going. But yeah. um, in, in any case, there's been like this almost huge 180 when, when it comes to people who traditionally say they are for workers' rights and things like that. And now we see people who traditionally are, you know, pro-labor, they are condemning uh, workers who go on strike against these vaccine mandates. They are supporting the idea that if you lose your job because you're not vaccinated, you should not be able to claim unemployment benefits. They are siding with big government. They are siding with big, uh, big pharma. It's just very strange how there's almost this double speak. They still believe that they are on, you know, the side of the little guy. Meanwhile, they, they have the, their boots on the necks of so many different companies and states. And it's great to see actually some pushback in the United States, because like in Canada, in Australia, Australia, aside from, I'm not saying every Canadian and every Australian mm -hmm. has taken this rolling over, but by and large, uh, yeah, the populations do support this. Po the populations are going along with this. And it's been uh, honestly a blow to my morale as, as a Canadian and as, you know, someone who has visited Australia and wanted to go back at some point to see how, uh, these people by and large, again, general, generalizing, um, are so quick to throw away for their freedom. Right, so clearly, I mean, a whole bunch of people are just, you know, staying silent and staying scared, but there are tons of videos also of people pushing back and, you know, there are rallies in Paris and even in Australia mm -hmm. and some in Canada and elsewhere. Stu, we never see any of that on the mm -hmm. media, which maybe is even more specifically to Lauren's point. It's like, we all kind of feel like we're losing because the media doesn't even show us what's actually happening. And there is some pushback. Uh, there is some pushback, and I think people do recognize that this just feels wrong. It feels off. It doesn't feel very American, and it's because we've come a long way. You know, I think 
there, you know, conservatives have spent a lot of time talking about whether, you know, they might think the vaccines aren't as effective as have been reported or um, talking about maybe COVID isn't as bad as, as others, uh, you know, have said. And, and all that's really important stuff to cover. But it boils down to this. If the vaccine was 100 percent effective and it and COVID killed every single person who got it, you still shouldn't be able to do this. Mm -hmm. You still shouldn't be able to mandate that people take it. We are this is an individualist base of a society. We are not a collectivist society. And this is I think this will eventually be overturned in the courts. I, I am hopeful on that front. But first of all, you're going to have a bunch of businesses doing it anyway in preparation as this goes forward. And there's a fundamental seed in our, our country that allows this sort of nonsense to go on. You know, you look at OSHA and the standard that is set by OSHA. I, I, I wrote this down so I'd remember it. But the quote that's that creates the idea that OSHA can do this is if it is reasonably necessary or appropriate to provide safe or healthful employ, uh, employment or places of employment. That is that could be anything. Yeah. It could be anything. And all the only thing that matters with that standard is who's in power. If if someone who likes the vaccines in power one day, who knows? We could have tomorrow if someone gets uh, becomes president and they think this, the cure to this is mask mandates or uh, vitamin D or hydroxychloroquine or whatever else, they can have that same exact standard. And there's so much of this in our administrative state that allows people to think they can get away with this crap. And it should be a focus on any party that actually cares about personal liberty, which the Republicans continually say they do, to do something about this. Yeah. And to your point, the way they use language is so Orwellian because the implication is that if you don't go along with them, that you're the unreasonable one. And it's like, you're not going to mm. believe this. But a couple weeks ago, my uh, producer sitting right here, Michael, had a, the sniffles. He had the sniffles. And he said, Dave, should I come into work today? I said, maybe don't come in today. If you feel better, you can come in tomorrow. And we all survived. Everyone in this room is alive and healthy. It's really crazy. I didn't force them to get uh, well, it could end at any anything. time for you, Dave. It <laughs> could end at any time. You could fall over in the middle of the show. Anything could happen. I, I want to pull up a tweet because I, I triggered a lot of weirdos this morning, a lot of blue check people. Can you pull this up? This is what I said on Twitter this morning. I didn't mean to, to you know, get into a fight with people. I said, I know a lot of people who regret getting the vaccine, don't know anyone who regrets not getting it. Uh, that was just my personal um, feelings on this, that I personally know several people who have had adverse reactions. I know two women that are having balance issues. I have a good friend who's about my age, who's really like had no energy for about three months. Uh, I know a couple women because we're in the middle of surrogacy that their, their uh, cycles are off, like a bunch of stuff. And I have a bunch of friends that are unvaxxed and nobody regrets it because they see that it's clearly not working. Well, anyway, I got a million people saying that I want people to die and all the rest of it. Um, is it possible that some people might be regretting some of the decisions and the way they were forced into this stuff, Allison? The ones that are still thinking clearly, yes, it's entirely possible, but the ones that have been brainwashed to the point of being incapable of critically thinking and connecting the dots in their own life, no. I mean, they have doubled, tripled down on this vaccine and the notion that it could cause any sort of harm to anyone is blasphemy at this point. I mean, it's so... It's so mind boggling because I've been on that side with you, Dave. Like I got all the tweets when I had to, yep. to go public with my decision and people blast me. I mean, they wish death upon me and yep. my child. I mean, they're sick and, and they're demented. And I don't see anybody who's unvaccinated wishing death upon the vaccinated. Like, no, we want this to work. We hope it's the golden ticket you've been sold. It just doesn't look like it is right now. And the data is not lining up with, with these beliefs that this is like the cure all and the only way forward. If you want to use it as a tool in the fight, great. But this is a, apparently a war we're in, and there's multiple uh, weapons at your disposal. If I don't choose to use a vaccine, why is that a problem? And if I acknowledge that for some people, there have been adverse reactions, which are well documented in the vaccine adverse reaction system. I mean, there's over 17,000 deaths. There's only over 2,500 miscarriages. This is real. We have to stop gaslighting these people. And just because you're so far down in this rabbit hole and, and, and so convinced in this echo chamber you're living in that there's nothing wrong with this vaccine, doesn't mean you should be gaslighting people who are having problems with it. Yeah, so Lauren, to that point, is that like, what do we do about the people? Because I think there's a whole bunch of people that either regret their decision, as I was saying in the tweet, or, but they've gone in so deep at this point. You know, they've basically been like, oh no, vax, vax, vax. And when they find out the efficacy isn't as good as it was supposed to be, they still say more vax, more boosters. Like, how do we, how do we help unbrainwash 
some of these people. Is there a way or do we just have to kind of bid them adieu? Well, I think in a perfect world, the way forward would be to highlight the cases where people do have adverse reactions. And, you know, we've seen uh, countries in Europe specifically highlight adverse reactions, specifically with people under 30 when it comes to the Moderna vaccine. Uh, You know, there's a lot of uh, speculation going on whether it, it makes sense to vaccinate especially young children who might be at greater risk of vaccine side effects than they would be of COVID. We've had some researchers suggest that, uh, no, actually, we should stop giving the vaccine to pregnant women until we can conduct more studies. And the thing is, there is really no medical treatment that is 100% free of side effects or that is completely safe for everybody. Not even peanuts are safe for everybody. So for the, especially mainstream media to be acting like this vaccine is this ma- magic cure-all, it just doesn't make sense. And I think it's it's honestly coercive, and I would say just plain immoral to try to shove this down people's throats without letting them know that, yeah, you know, you might you might be fine. Hopefully you are. I don't wish bad side effects on every anybody, but you there are some things you might want to consider. You may want to re- weigh things and determine whether the risk is right for you. But for saying things simply like that, uh, you know, people have been censored off social media. Doctors are, uh, you know, getting kicked out of their practices for having hesitancy. So what we see is that this is not about science. This is about ideology. And, you know, we we all accept that, uh, you know, corporations can be corrupt, that the government can be corrupt. But for some reason now there's like this cult forming around uh, doctors and the established uh, approved medical narrative. And we should be concerned about that. It's very concerning to not be able to question what people are forcing into your body. Right. It's sort of hilarious. It's like the most dystopian movie ever where the pharmaceutical companies are the ones who can't be questioned. It's very weird. The, the other piece of this is that the new thing is that, oh, none of us will be safe till everyone is safe. So I want to throw to this video. This is uh, a Chicago Public Health Commissioner uh, basically saying that until everybody is vaccinated in schools, we probably won't open or you'll have to mask up or we'll wrap you in plastic. Let's see. You know, do offer particular vulnerabilities. Uh, if there are younger children still who have not had the opportunity uh, to be vaccinated, that'll be something we'll be looking at. Um, my expectation is schools would probably be one of the last places, honestly, um, that we would not have masks in place. But if we can get to a point where schools are 100% vaccinated, that would be the setting I uh, would be particularly interested in. And then- All right. So to be clear, first off, it's a it's a hundred percent impossible that a hundred percent will be vaccinated. It's just not. Schools don't even have a hundred percent literacy rates nowadays. Right. Right, Their their vaccine rate should be congruent with their literacy rate. That would be pretty hilarious. Um, But not only that, but also I've read this stat 400,000 times. Uh, The the morbidity rate for children 5 to 11 is 0.002. It's under 500 children. And in many cases, they had all sorts of other problems and everything else. Uh, Stu, what do we do about this idea, though, that, you know, until everybody is vaccinated, now we're still going to keep kids in masks? I mean, I've seen my nieces and nephews in in masks, you know, five, six-year-olds. This is not how children are supposed to grow up. Science is uh, is really the thing we should be chasing here. There's you don't get that anywhere on anything, including all the childhood vaccines uh, that are already in place with mandates in schools. You don't have a hundred percent compliance on those things. You never will. And you know, every once in a while, I try to put myself in the mindset of the other side. Right? I for me, I take care of my own health. I, I, I that's how I see the world. Right? Like it's my responsibility. It's interesting that the other side of this sees themselves as unsafe unless everyone protects them. Mm-hmm. And that's a look, if you look at it that way, it's it's a scary world to be in, right? Um, but we have a situation where they want everyone else to be vaccinated. They want everyone else to wear cloth masks that do basically nothing. There is a solution here that's pretty clear to me, <laughs> which is- Yeah, I got it. <laughs> no, I mean, this is serious. Yeah. There is a solution where we have N95 masks, which do actually do something and have showed some actual difference when you when you test them, uh, not only in, in labs, but in real in real world situations for various viruses around the world. And it, the best part about that is you are protecting yourself. You don't need everyone around you to wear an N95 mask. You just need to wear one yourself. And you notice the government never comes out and recommends people wear effective masks. They just want everyone to wear masks that don't work which doesn't make any sense. You know, this is the United States of America. We have to be able to sit here and say, 
we are responsible for our own health and understand that people are going to have different views. If you look at, go down the cold aisle of, of your CVS, you're going to find all sorts of medications. You're also going to find all sorts of herbal cures. You're going to find all sorts of stuff. Some of it you might think doesn't work. Some of it, the person next to you will think that is that is going to work. We are at a situation right now, right now, that 80% of all adults have already taken the vaccine. Not are considering it, have already taken it, 80%. What on earth did they think was going to happen here? You know, there there has to be some level of understanding of who the American people are. They're not people that are just going to bend over for every one of your mandates. They are going to make their own decisions. And if your product is as good as you say it is, let it speak for itself and people will choose it. So last thought on this for everybody. To me, it seems at this point, this has nothing to do with COVID, the virus, and hasn't probably for over a year, that it has something to do with a much worse mind virus about humans' desire to control other people and how quickly we all fold. We all have ideas that we'll stand up to the machine and fight for what's right and say what we think, but we see how quickly people don't do that. Allison, do you think that's like a fair assessment at this point that there's another problem that's not really COVID? Like, cause we're not really talking about COVID this whole 20 minutes so far, we're really talking about the other problem that COVID has unearthed. It's the psychological warfare that's yeah. going on right now. I mean, to Stu's point, this is the conditioning that's been taking place for the last year and a half plus. This notion that not only do you not have to take responsibility for yourself and for your own health, but that you get to blame others if you get sick. That That is insanity to me. And this notion that children should be wearing masks to protect others, I mean, like at what cost, right? Because at some point you have mm -hmm. to step back and say, what are the ramifications of this? I mean, the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared a mental health emergency for children in this country. We are seriously harming our children with, with these protocols that we have put in place because of COVID-19. So there is clearly some sort of compliance and control issue that's taking place, a conditioning that's taking place, especially towards our children. I mean, we've talked about it time and time again. The data doesn't back any of it up. So what is this really about? It's about compliance. It's about control. And I, I think the more we get into this pandemic, the more be that becomes very apparent. And how about the irony, guys, that this is this is somebody in Chicago where more children have died of gun violence mm -hmm. this year than of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you get... have a threat to your children there, and it's not the virus, it's the violence. Let's get the Chicago gun death numbers. For I do this so, almost as a joke at this point every week because it's so ridiculous that obviously the deaths are tragic, but you're completely right. Nobody cares about that because unfortunately they don't like the racial makeup of who's shooting who in this case. So we'll get the numbers on that in a sec. Lauren, in the meantime, take it away. Well, I think Allison is completely right. This is not about COVID. This is about control. I mean, just look at so many different uh, restrictions and mandates we've seen that made absolutely no sense if we actually care about the virus. The fact that you can take off your mask when you eat in a restaurant, but kids who are stuck in the school at their own desk, they need to keep their masks on the entire day. Uh, if we actually cared about transmission, uh, we wouldn't be using vaccine passports because you can still transmit the virus when you have the vaccine, we would probably be doing what a lot of places started doing early on in the pandemic, where it's you, you just take someone's temperature because we know that the transmission rates, if you're asymptomatic, are so, so low. And, you know, obviously you can't spread COVID if you don't have it. This is all about control. I mean, that's why you, you even see that online students who have no in-person classes are still being, I guess, kicked out of their universities for not being vaccinated, which makes absolutely no sense. And, um, I think what this has revealed is that there is a shockingly large percent of the population who is happy to go along with whatever the government says. They want to play hall monitor, tattletale, call the police on their neighbors for having gatherings when they're not supposed to. And that is kind of like the main problem that I see right now. Like, all right, what do we do when we live in a society where, you know, around half of the people don't want you to be able to make your own choices. They want to make those choices for you. What is the best way forward? How can you like live peaceably together when the other side simply does not want to let you be? That and Dave, can we call out the hypocrisy that's going on in this country real quick as someone that lives in the yeah. sports world? Um, every weekend, I watch 100,000 football fans pack into Michigan Stadium or, or into Tennessee. And on Sunday, you know, there's 60,000 shoulder to shoulder um, in football stadiums across the country. And then these same people wake up on Monday and they send their school, their kids to school <laughs> and masks and with yeah. plexiglass behind, between like what are we doing? I mean, the yeah. hypocrisy right now is just through the roof and, and people can't even see it. 
Yeah, all right, I want to give you some numbers. Let me give you some numbers on the Chicago situation real quick, and then, Stu, you'll bring us home on COVID, and then I want to move on. Uh, 10 people were shot dead in Chicago last week, 42 wounded by gunfire. Mm, don't talk about that on CNN, very curious. All right, Stu, give us a nice closing statement on COVID. Chicago. I was there for uh, a baseball weekend. I wanted to go to Wrigley. I'd never been before. I uh, did a baseball weekend uh, this summer in uh, Chicago. Uh, Cubs were very bad. Uh, but other than that, uh, you have, as, as Allison pointed out, a stadium filled with people, completely sold out in Lori Lightfoot's Chicago, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder. But I think even worse than that, you know, and there's an outdoor venue. We have no instances, right, of a super spreader event at an outdoor venue since the beginning of COVID. But however, if you've ever been to Wrigley, the area Wrigleyville around there is basically nonstop bars that yeah. were built oh, yeah. 75 years ago with no ventilation. They're all indoors. It's musty. You know, everyone is packed in there. I went upstairs to one of them and they had in action a dueling piano bar where everyone's doing sing-alongs indoors. And like this goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning of this. Even in a place like Chicago, an incredibly liberal city, People are just done with this. We spent a ton of time talking about these restrictions and we have to fight hard against them to make them go away. But really what makes them stop is when people just stop paying attention to them and go about their business. And that is happening all over the country. Yeah, well, you did bring us home in the right way because that's what my message is at this point. I'm gonna really try not to focus on just, okay, the stupid COVID information of the day. It's like, go live your life. All right, but let's, uh, let's switch for the remaining few minutes. Obviously, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial has been this week, and it's been just a perfect example um, of the split in this country, that people watch the exact same thing and just see it in completely, completely different ways. So there are two videos I want to throw to here. First off, half of the internet, half of Twitter, which maybe I should be spending less time on, uh, have <laughs> no doubt about that. Uh, yes, half of Twitter was going crazy because the judge, his phone rang during the trial and you're not gonna believe what his ringtone was. Take a listen. I, I don't think that's necessarily what I'm supposed to do. But I think the court has to make some findings as it relates to the bad faith on the part of the prosecution. And if the court makes a finding that uh, the actions that I had talked about were done in bad faith, then I think both elements. If you didn't quite catch that, uh, the judge's ringtone was God bless the USA, which I'm not even gonna bother showing you the amount of blue check Twitter people who were saying that he's now a white supremacist. This mm -hmm. is the call of MAGA and Trump. I mean, just absolute insanity. Lauren, I know you've been paying a lot of attention to the trial. So any direction you wanna go here. Well, so first off, this is not the only time that the judge has had his phone ring with that ringtone. It happened several times today. Uh, just the uh, the jury has been dismissed for, for the weekend, but there's still a meeting between the defense prosecutor and the judge. This has happened several times just today. Uh, this judge is more popular than me, I tell you, because his phone is just ringing off the hook nonstop. <laughs> but it's very strange for the left. Who, you know, oftentimes it's the right that is uh, alleging that the left is not patriotic. You don't actually love your country. And we hear the left go like, no, 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 that's not true. Just patriotism is not just for the right. And I agree that it should not be. But then here uh, we see very clearly that when confronted with a song that is obviously patriotic, God bless the USA, they are so quick to uh, connect that to white supremacy, Donald Trump, MAGA, political bias. It's like, wait a second. I thought you guys were arguing that this type of thing was for everybody. Now, all of a sudden, because it suits you and you're trying to paint the judge's bias, you're saying it's this, uh, you know, I guess, dog whistle toward the far right, which is ridiculous. He's also been called a a, a racist because he referred to like Asian delivery that the, the jury had ordered as an Asian person. Um, that's I don't understand how that is racist in any way, shape or form. But I think they know the trial is not going the way that they want. So they are just looking at anything they can pick apart to say this was biased, uh, retrial, et cetera, et cetera. Lauren, you're obviously a self-hating Asian because you're not <laughs> offended enough, right? <laughs> Stu, what, what do you make yes. of the trial? just generally speaking, what do you think is happening here at this point? 
Well, first of all, I do want judges in our uh, justice system that know how to put their phone on silent. Yeah. And that yeah. is a real problem. Uh, we do need to solve that one. It seems like the left, though, just wants him to have the Soviet national anthem instead. And then, then right. they would be fine with it. You know, I don't mind my judges liking America. I think it's actually kind of a, a good thing. Um, and, and we have a justice system that is supposed to push back against Twitter. And you're seeing in the Rittenhouse uh, uh, saga that this is what happens when you turn that justice system over to people who are on social networks. This is a social network fueled fi uh, trial. It should not even be a trial at all. We have video of every moment of this and anyone who watches it can clearly see he's in a, in a position of self-defense. A couple really important parts of, of what you see on video where, where uh, uh, someone comes up to attack Kyle Rittenhouse, mm -hmm. he brings his gun up and points it at them, they back off and he does not fire. That is crucial to what is in his mind at this time. And we're all going to, I think, agree that he should be, uh, he should not be convicted of, of these really harsh charges. Um, however, that's not really enough. You know, it's not enough for him to just get an acquittal. They've ruined his life for a year. And while I think you can sincerely look, because I have a I have a 10 year old son and in seven years, I am not going to advise him to take guns mm -hmm. to riot scenes and try to patrol them. I don't think it was a good decision and you can criticize that decision. But this is a court of law. Uh, we can all talk on Twitter. We can talk on 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 on, on the Internet about what we think the right choice was. Uh, as far as his travel plans for that particular uh, evening. Um, but when it comes down to the law, this is supposed to be open and shut. And in this case, it should have even been an open. There is no there's no reason with the amount of video that we have of this case that it should have ever been able to get to this point. And it's it's scary because we're now fueling our legal system with what gets the most retweets. And that's not a way for a civilization to operate. Yeah, Allison, is that the key point? Because, you know, even Joe Biden called Kyle Rittenhouse a white supremacist. I mean, there's no evidence that he's a white supremacist. Uh, and as uh, Stu points out, like maybe he made a mistake by going or shouldn't have been there or whatever. Um, but that we're, we're just doing this all on social media. And no matter what happens, MSNBC is gonna report it one way. The internet's gonna report it another way. Like we're just caught in that. Yeah, and I, I think what's happening here is what we've seen so often lately, and it's it's the two courts in which we're prosecuted. One is the court of law, and the other one is the court of public opinion. And the court of uh, public opinion is very quick to rush to judgment, and that's what we're seeing in Kyle Rittenhouse's case. Honestly, you guys, I think if you were to pull the majority of Americans who are like kind of on the surface following this case, I don't think they realize that the victim— and I will call them victims, um, the two men that were shot by Rittenhouse, three, if you include the survivor, were all white. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't think people realize <laughs> yeah. that, honestly. Um, if I'm being completely honest, it wasn't until recently that I did. I just assumed, I mean, he was at a Black Lives Matter protest um, and the way the left has reacted to this and and the divide that we've seen in regards to him and calling him a white supremacist, I just figured the people that were killed and, and the one that was shot were black. And I, I still think there's a lot of people that believe that to this day. So the fact that that the victims were all white is kind of being glossed over by the left. I think that's really telling as far as how they want uh, to paint the picture of this trial and what's going on in the court. No, it's a great point. I mean, the guy shot three white people without getting into the specifics. So it's like he's not doing white supremacy that great. All right, we got one more, one more, <laughs> one more video for you. Uh, which this one, I mean, to me, when he gets acquitted, and of course I think he should, and I, I hope that he does, um, this might be the moment of the entire trial because basically the prosecutor was trying to take away Kyle's uh, right to not um, discriminate, you know, not to incriminate against himself, his right to remain silent. Take a look. You need to account for this. Your Honor, I don't want to... He's commenting on my client's right to remain silent. No, Your Honor. I am making the point that after hearing everything in the case, now he's tailoring his story to what has already been introduced. That the is problem is, this is a grave constitutional violation for you to talk about the defendant's silence. And that is, and, and, the, and you're right. You're right on the you're right on the borderline, and you may you may be over, but uh, it better stop. Understood. 
this is, I can't think of the case, the initial case on it, but it's, uh, this is not permitted. You know, I sort of wish the judge had been a little more forceful there. He was a little muddled in the way he said it, but I mean, a grave constitutional violation. You may be over the line. I mean, it seems like he was completely over the line. Lauren, you said you've been hearing some legal people talk about a mistrial even related to this. Right. So this is not the first time that I think the prosecution and I mean, obviously not just me, but more importantly, the judge in this case thinks the prosecution has stepped out of line. So he was the prosecution um, kind of insinuating that the fact that Kyle had uh, yet to comment on the case until his testimony almost indicated that he was trying to like craft his narrative until mm -hmm. everyone else had already said something, which like the judge was saying is not allowed by the Constitution. You have a right to remain silent. Later on in the case, the uh, the prosecutor also implied that a, a witness who was, I mean, kind of on Kyle's side, uh, the fact that he had retained a lawyer to deal with the, the legal system indicated he was biased or maybe untrustworthy, which is also, of course, ridiculous. You have a right to an attorney. And, uh, you know, second, the prosecutor, or third, sorry, the prosecution also ended up uh, trying to introduce some evidence into the case that the judge had uh, not permitted him to do. And there was another little separate blowout for that. So a lot of people are thinking that the reason why the prosecution is being so brazen and ignoring all of these established legal rules is because they want a mistrial because they know the case isn't going their way. They would like to have a do-over, uh, but that may not go their way, especially if uh, Kyle's defense files for a mistrial with prejudice, which they have mentioned they may do, in which case if that uh, you know does go through, it's granted, then they won't, the state will not be able to file charges again against Kyle. And if unless there's federal charges brought, he will be uh, walking clear of this. So that's something that a lot of people are waiting to see, like I guess what develops over the weekend and what Monday brings. Yeah, we shall see. Uh, I believe Stu froze up. He froze? We've lost Stu. Am I frozen? Oh, oh wait, Can you hear you're me? back. Wait, is he back? I'm back. He's yes. back. Stu, you're back. I was just, Allison I was just was about to, You know waiting. what? I'm going to give Allison the final word either way because it's her first time on the show. So, Stu, you want to make any predictions here? Are you in the prediction game? That's what political people like to do, right? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, there is. Uh, I do think he will be acquitted on this. Like, as I said, I, I don't think it will be enough. Um, but the legal system seems to be one of the last places we even have a chance to keep uh, our actual foundational principles intact. You know, a lot of people are talking about the Constitution. He, he mentioned the Constitution and it, obviously a really vital part of all of this. But your right to defend yourself does not come from Kenosha, does mm -hmm. not come from Wisconsin. It does not come from the federal government. It does not come from the Constitution. Your right to defend yourself is a right that is inherent for you as a human from God, if you don't believe in God, it's either way, it's still yours. No government can take it away. And I hope, I hope that we are still at a point where at least the legal system can 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 look at these things and understand that even if it's not popular, even if you're worried that, you know, some uh, some activist is going to burn your city down the next day, you still make the choice that that focuses on the individual case on its merits, because it doesn't feel like that happens in the media anymore. That's gone. This court of public opinion seems to be already lost. But it, at least the legal system can stand up and and give this kid his his rightful freedom after this, uh, even after uh, we have uh, this long debate. And he pays a serious price just to get to this point. Stu, that was a fine closing argument. Allison, I'm going to give you the last word. You know, every day on the show, I try to end it with something a little bit uplifting, especially on Fridays, to show people that there are more of us and that we have a chance and that better days are ahead and all of that stuff. So can you just bring us home on, now that you've been through the machine and they called you all sorts of mean things and you still got a new job and you're obviously flourishing and doing great, uh, can you just give people a little bit of that message to take away for the weekend? Yes, and thank you for that opportunity because I think that's really important in these times. We've been told a lot of lies throughout this pandemic and I think a lot of us are, are in our own time and at our own pace waking up to them. But let me tell you right now, the biggest lie you're being told is that if you have questions about the this vaccine or if you have questions about the motives of the government and the overreach and the, the, um, the, the I wanna, how do I even say this? Like the way they're trying to destroy the freedoms that you mm -hmm. hold dear. If you think you are alone in that, you are not. That is the biggest lie is that we are the minority, that this group that is so loud and, and so antagonistic and so hateful that they are the majority. They are not. They are the loudest 
but they are not the greatest. And I have been overwhelmed with messages of support, um, of gratitude from people who think like us and feel like us. And look, when I was in it, it was a really, really lonely and scary place. But I'm telling you, once you speak out, you will realize you are one of millions. And you know what? Every single person without exception that I know that has been through the machine, either at a micro level, just doing what they thought was right at their job or at a public level, everyone comes out better on the other side, every single person. Uh, all right, I wanna thank Allison and Lauren and Stu. I'm gonna finish up without you guys for about a minute, but have a good weekend and uh, we'll do it again for sure. And for, uh, for you guys watching, uh, I think Allison's message was right, guys. Not only are there more of us, uh, but we are starting to get louder. We are starting to get braver. But what they are, what they are using is our fear. And that's what we gotta take away from them. If we just take that away from them and you just start telling your neighbors and your family and your friends and everybody else just what you think, not because you're a crazy right-wing racist maniac, just because you kind of think that you can manage your health and you know how you wanna live your life and what you wanna do with your family and the type of people you wanna work with and everything else, I think that's a better message. I actually think that decency and logic and reason and love and belief, I think all of these things are a lot better than what they're selling. And if we can incorporate that into our own lives, I think that's the best thing that we can possibly, possibly do. Uh, guys, I am heading off to Nashville for a couple days. I'll be on Candace Owens show on the Daily Wire on, we're taping it on Monday. Does it air on Monday as well? Uh, I think so, yeah. Uh, so that should be on Monday. And then I'm gonna interview Candace on her set for our show. Uh, so we won't have shows in studio on Monday and Tuesday, but I'm back on Wednesday. And there's a bunch of other good things happening. You know, I have a way of teasing things to you guys. And then some of you kind of figure it out. Usually in the Ruben Report community, you figure it out a little bit first, but good things are happening, trust me. So have a great weekend, everybody. And I'll see you in a couple days.